the framework of an honors college is very successful. We have smaller classes, we have more opportunities, we have mentorship, we have, right? It's very successful. A lot of times schools are retaining those those students oh. really well, oh, but yeah. it's because of the model. If you take that model and you say, think considering you know, resilience and all these other things, we're going to say, you're going to have smaller classes and you're going to have connection to our best faculty and you're going to be able to have these special opportunities. You will see retention and student success increase for that group of students because it's a great model for how to keep them. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for Cap and Gown. I'm Rachel Phillips-Buck, joined today by Matt Boisvert. Hey, Matt. Hello. Hi, Rachel. Um, we did not do an episode last week because we were visiting campuses and we had a um, conference that we went to. But you know that just this time last week, we were walking onto Mars Hill's campus and we met Lisa on campus. Right now. And she was saying, yeah. right now, she was saying, I said, she was like, I guess you're not doing cap and gown today. And I said, no, because we're here. And she's like, good, because I was just worried that you were going to be sad. I wasn't going to join you. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you wouldn't get in trouble for that. Good to see you. Um, episode 55, you guys, today we are talking about best practices of uh, relationship rich education coming out of this book, um, which is a really great. Oh, you got Sorry. I forget that people are also just listening. Just to listening. So when I say this yeah. book, I mean, relationship rich education, <clears throat> Peter Felton and Leo Lambert. Um, this is a really great book because it talks through it. It basically moves past the, like, are relationships important to our students and goes to like, yes, of course they are. How are you weaving those into the actual things that you're doing? So, yeah. Um, it's a really great book. I want to talk today about practical things. One of the benefits, Matt, to you and I being able to travel is that we go and we talk to people and we hear about things that are happening on their campuses and great ideas. And so our focus today is just going to be to lay out um, some of those really exceptional ideas that speak to the fact that you're invested in a relationship-rich culture on your campus. So I, I love today's topic. It's great. Yeah. And this is like idea land. You know what I mean? Like here's all of the little ways that you can invest in these, um, in these practices. Hey Kirk, good to see you joining us. Okay. First though, we have to do state of the union. Uh, um, yeah. What is I'm the state gonna, of the union? Well, I'm going to tell you about it in just one second, but I want to tell you one of the articles that I was reading as I was doing state of the union was talking about like 16 uh, icebreakers for your team. And so I printed them off and it was like, we, when we have our team meetings, we like to start with these icebreakers, but they were like, tell me about a traumatic childhood experience and how that shaped you. And yeah, I didn't feel ice. like that was an icebreaker. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> I feel like that was the beginning of a therapy session. So I wouldn't recommend those. Let's get we're not that part. Those. Yeah. We're not going to do this. Okay. Let me give you the state of the union. So okay. I'm just going to get this kind of, distressing news out of the way first, and then we'll move on to more positive things. Um, the financial service company Fitch Ratings has just come out with their estimate on higher education enrollment, especially um, they are projecting losses in higher education enrollment for another year or so. Um, probably going to see relief for those losses in 2025. But then any gains by four-year publics and privates are expected to be below 1% through 2030. So wow. there's just a lot going on. If you think about, we have inflation, we have a strong labor market, we have employer initiatives to attract and retain workers, including on-the-job training. You have a trend, especially in particular sectors where they are relaxing degree requirements and focusing on skill-based criteria now. So just depending on where you are, what, how your demographics are changing, um, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens over the next several years. But I will tell you, some schools are having a lot of success with increased enrollment uh, like applications, and those primarily are coming from schools that are offering great financial aid packages. They're keeping their tuition on level or reducing them, 
And this one's interesting to me, Matt, providing an array of services, resources, and flexibility that students now expect. So we know one of the things that came out of COVID and the pandemic is that students are like, I want to be able to do Zoom calls with student services. I want to be able to take my classes when I need to, right? All of those different elements right. that we've seen coming out. So there are things you can do to mitigate that, but it's um, projected to not be a huge enrollment growth over the next couple of years. Okay. Next thing, historical black colleges and universities. So this is really interesting because, you know, all of our schools got COVID relief fund money. There were rules about what you had to do with that. But then HBCUs got a whole other pot of money. It was $5.2 billion just for those schools. What's interesting about that is that um, it expires or I don't think expires is the right word. Let's see. It comes with a deadline. It has to be spent by June of 2023. So they can't put it in their endowment. They can't, they, they have to figure out what they're going to do with it. Um, to give you some context for that. So Kenny Spade, the business director at Fayette, uh, Fayette State University said that is the most money they've ever been uh, granted. The $80 million his university got is equal to more than half of their entire annual operating budget. So it's a really huge amount of money to, to support these schools, which I love. Here's what some things, uh, what schools are doing with it. Uh, NCANT is the nation's largest HBCU. It got $188 uh, million. Dollars. Um, wow. They offered free summer courses which is great. They used it to fund grants for housing and dining discounts to their residential students and give iPads to freshmen and free textbooks to all students. And I wanted to circle back to this iPad piece because that seems like kind of a like, oh, and then we just gave them iPads. But what their president said was, when you have a student who is showing up to their class with this technology, they feel like a scholar. It's not just like they're watching movies on it or whatever, but they feel equipped to then be successful in the classroom with note taking and their textbooks on those iPads and all that kind of stuff. So I love that rationale for doing That's that. That's great. Um, a lot of schools canceled students' outstanding balances, which is awesome. At Florida A&M University, students can enroll if they have a balance of above $500. So they took $60 million of the relief funds they got and paid off um, those balances, balances so that students could then enroll and continue on and be successful. Um, they've already seen a significant increase in freshman and sophomore year retention because they were able to do that. So it's so crazy to me because it's not a huge amount of money, right? Like $500 is not a huge uh, investment in those students, but it's really going to make a big difference. And then there are a lot of schools that updated their technology and infrastructure. So like equipping their classes with cameras so that they could do online learning, um, the upshot of that for many of these schools is that now they are equipped to do online extension classes. So as their students have come back, because they have cameras and all of the resources that they need, they can actually grow their online program. Um, and then a lot of like building fixes, like there's a, there's mold in this building and we've got to go through and fix that. So I love that. I am super excited for those schools to have the resources um, to be able to support their students. And yeah, make investments they haven't been able to make. Yeah. Um, so comes yeah, at a great right. time for them. Very excited about that. Um, Matt, one of the big things that we have been talking about, um, so you and I were traveling last week, but then you were out the week before. One of the big things that is coming up in conversation is this test optional issue. Every, it's really funny to me because it's like people feel very strongly one way or another, but it's not always consistent, right? And some of that, um, is about the, the students you're serving. Some of that is about your mission, your goals for enrollment. There's a lot of moving pieces in that. The good news is that the um, Gates Foundation just get, gave NACAC um, uh, $1.4 million to study this issue, to try to understand when schools go test optional, what happens to their enrollment numbers, what happens to their underserved population. So I am very eager for that to come out because I just think there's so many moving pieces. I would like to see a good study of it. Um, however, so 
1,800 four-year institutions are not mandating entrance exams for fall 2023 admissions. So I think, what did you say? That's like half? Yeah, it's, it's like half? 45%. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's some use cases that we can look at. The University of Pennsylvania saw a 34% increase in applications in 2021. Um, that's a crazy school to compare it to because their apps are like <laughs> went from 42,000 applications to 56,000 applications. Right. So we're not most of the time in schools of that scale. Um, but they did see in that increase a bump in first generation international and students of color. So that's awesome. If your mission is to serve some of those underserved populations, you might want to think about um, this uh, test optional. Um, also, we have a, a weird thing that happened at Queens University of Charlotte in North Carolina, where when they removed their test optional, they actually got a fewer students who were considered like barely academically eligible. So the, the academic preparedness of their students increased, yeah. um, as well as the percentage of students that had a higher, like in the top 10%, they had like nine, 9% 9 of their students applying. So that's a weird thing. Well, right? I would be very curious for our schools to, to um, let us know. So going test optional, did you see an increase in applications? Maybe students who wouldn't have, wouldn't have made that um, effort to apply, but since you're test optional, they decided to. And did that then increase your pool so that you could select higher quality? Uh, what One thing that I'm from, a, I guess, high school GPA standpoint, one thing I'm curious about is moving forward, what is the standard for how you measure a yeah. student's preparedness or ability to be successful at your institution? For sure. So this is the conversation that we've been having is people are like, Rachel, are you pro or con test optional? And I'm like... I love that it means different students are applying. It does not solve the problem for our practitioners of being able to identify students who are more likely to need support, right? Because it's just a piece of information that we don't have about them. So we do have to solve that, um, that part. I, I think, uh, like I started this story, you have to think about the reasons behind your choice, either to go test optional or to keep test. And you have right. to think about how you expect that to impact your enrollment. And then you have to have measurements of how it does impact your enrollment. So um, I think it's super interesting spark conversation to have with our schools to be looking at like, what is, how has that shifted or changed the population of students that are applying and that you've uh, admitted? So. <clears throat> Okay, I'm just full of fun stories today. Let's talk about <laughs> Title IX. <laughs> you guys. All right. Well, Title IX is a big, I mean, I, I don't know, every, so I spent last week or two weeks ago, and it was um, policy sessions. And yeah. I mean, there's, so Title IX is back, back up. Uh, as so a, here's why. So how do we adapt? Yeah, here's topic. why Title IX is huge right now, because you guys remember they were going to tell you their revisions in April, and then it was May, and then it was the end of June. And so they opened up comments at the end of June. They're closed now, but basically there were 240,000 comments on the proposed changes that they're going to make. Almost all of them were like, these changes are a terrible idea. Please do not do this. So we have to see what's going to happen with any revisions, you know, whether or not they listen to people. What I think is so fascinating about this is that, um, so you guys can read all of the nitpicky stuff. The general idea is that Title IX was going to use a model that was coming out, I think it was the University of Oregon, who based on the last Dear Colleague letter University of Oregon said, everybody on our campus, every staff, in fact, is a mandatory reporter. If you hear anything about sexual harassment or sexual abuse, you have to report it, whether or not the person who's telling you wants you to do that. And all of these people who are experts in trauma and in recovery and, you know, sexual violence and all of that are like, hey, you have just made it so that there's no one a student can talk to 
because they will know this person doesn't have any leeway in whether they go report it to the Title IX coordinator. So most of those comments were like, please do not do this. There are some campuses where maybe that makes sense, but for many of our schools, that is not how we handle it. And we want to have the flexibility to say, yes, you need to be supportive of students, but you need to lead them through on a journey that makes sense for them. Not that you like get a whiff of something and then you have to go tell and then they, they're not going to be disclosing that information. So it's really, really interesting to see that is a, um, what's the snake viper effect, right? Cobra. Cobra, Cobra effect. effect. That is a COBRA effect. That's like, of course, it makes total sense for all faculty and staff to be mandatory reporters. And then you have experts in sexual trauma and violence saying, I understand what you're trying to accomplish, but it is not the best path forward in many cases. So we'll see what happens there. Um, actually, I don't know that I saw what the deadline was to have the the comments revised and then for them to go ahead and say like, this is what we're going to do, but it doesn't matter anyway, because they're not going to, they'll just make up a new deadline. So soon they will tell you what they've decided to do on that. I think it's a great example of large institutions um, creating the policies, right? Or the yeah. policies are created based on large institutions. But as we talk through today, the the role of your relationship with the student, the way that you come alongside them and mentor them and, and, and have deep connections that might lead to um, them, them entrusting you with some, with, you know, some trauma, something that happened to them. And then that can really ruin your relationship with that student. Right. Yeah. Especially yeah. if they weren't expecting that to be the outcome. You have so, to tell. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, okay. Last one that I have for you, and I'm really excited about this one. Um, you remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the student voice survey where students were like, we don't need anybody on campus. It doesn't matter to us. Like, yeah. 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 We don't need uh, student support offices to be staffed at all. What actually came out there was, again, that they want accessibility. So they want to be able to call when they need to, to be able to Zoom. They don't want to have to wait in office, all of that kind of stuff. Okay. Convenience. Well, they want, yeah. Conven they want convenience. So further coming out of that survey is a look at data um, on culture, um, service-oriented cultures at colleges that have a one-stop shop. So I want to talk about some of the data that they found about that, but also it's a great uh, segue to the fact that we have just hired a new team member, Rebecca Green, who was in charge of student services and financial counseling for a centralized office, exactly like we're talking about in this article. Right. Um, so she is our director of client success now. And I'm so excited, not only for her to be part of our team, but just all of the expertise she brings in this office that is created to make it easy for students to get what they need to, in one place, be able to engage with all of the different services that they need. So super excited to welcome Rebecca. This article says basically, if you are a campus that has a one-stop shop, um, all of the evidence says that it is gonna be a better service experience for your students in a lot of different ways. One thing I was surprised about is that not very many campuses have this one-stop shop um, model. So mm -hmm. student, yeah, students at private nonprofit colleges, 31% uh, of, of students at nonprofit colleges have that model on their campus. That they know of. That they know of. So okay. either they don't have it or they have it and they don't know about it, which is bad, right? That's a problem. So here's what I'm going to tell you. Um, Matt, I was saying to you, like, you know, we do conference presentations and then we get the, like, you have to do this, the survey at the end, like how well did this presenter do? And you and I both, like, <clears throat> if I get fives on everything, except one person gave me like a four on something, I couldn't care less about the fives on all of them. I'm like, what did I do wrong in that, <laughs> that one case, right. Right? Um, So I'm only going to give you the data on schools that have a one-stop shop. It is not reflective of good student uh, support, like service support. 
And also the campuses without a one-stop shop, it's worse. Okay. So I'm not going to do the comparison because it gets really complicated, but just know every number I give you for campuses that have this, this like centralized thing, the numbers, if you don't, are going to be worse than that. It, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And in some cases, way worse. Way worse. Yeah. Okay. So if you have a one-stop shop, the question for a student is how many of you have had to wait 30 minutes or more in a campus office for assistance? 28% of students with a one-stop shop said they did. So that's not great for, it's 40% for a school that doesn't have a one-stop shop, okay? Okay. Next. Um, so, if you have a hold, I'm sorry, but <clears throat> let's just make sense of that 30 minutes. That's half of a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class period, you know? Also, I'm, you know, I don't like wasting time and waiting <laughs> Waiting is one of my least favorite things. And I was trying to think, what is a sure. place I would go to where they would be like, hey, it's going to be a 45 minute wait. And I'd be like, okay. You know what I mean? I, I just, it, the I ER, would be maybe? to wait that long. Uh, yeah, I guess. I mean, okay. Had to wait on the phone for 30 minutes or more, which holy cow, waiting on the phone for 30 minutes or more with a one-stop shop. Oh, With a one-stop shop, it's 29% of students have had to wait on the phone for 30 minutes or more, which is a lot. I'll never forget the student at one of our universities we had just started working with and consulting with. And she said, yep, I know it's going to take that long. So I start cooking. And by the time I finish cooking, she someone calls will the answer. office. Yeah, she calls the office for lunch puts the phone so she can hear, cooks her lunch. And by the time it's done, usually that's how long it takes somebody to answer the phone, which she whiz. Um, I say this to say, I, it's really interesting because we are seeing this shift. I, Ferris has always been this way where we have the student at the center, but what's coming out of COVID is you see even more of a shift where it's like, um, we don't send students to eight different offices to get this thing done. We we put them all in one place. You put the student yeah. at the center of that. And so it's really interesting to see this shift continuing to happen um, for students. This one made me a little bit sad, though. This says, um, for students who do have a one-stop shop, um, how what percentage of your staff seem to be not at all happy? Like, so the percentage of students who said our staff on our campus seem not at all happy. 8% of students reported that the staff on their campus does not seem at all happy, which made me feel very, very sad. You know, like their reflection yeah. of these people in their jobs is they're miserable. I, I know, but I mean, that's a terrible experience for the student. And we're sad for that 8% where they're, they're miserable, their job. But we could also celebrate the 92% who seem to be happy, you know. Yeah, I mean, if you want to be optimistic about it, you can. <laughs> and that is the State of the Union. <laughs> that's it, huh, Rachel? That's okay, before, before, we get in, before we get into our great topic for the day, I just want you to say a thing, okay? So this is my, Matt's new segment for... You'll probably veto it moving forward, but we're going to just try this. Okay. Okay. All right. I want you to say a thing. I'm going to say a phrase or a word, and I want you to say a thing. The first thing, the Frito pie. Say a thing about Frito pie. Okay. Well, first of all, my first thing to say is this is very, you're stressing me out. So that's the first uh, thing I have to say. Yeah. Um, Frito pie. Here's what I have to say about Frito pie. When I was a little girl, my mom would make Frito pie all the time, and I have very nostalgic feelings for it. And then I grew up and I made it the way that she made it, and I realized that it was not always delicious the way she made it. So then I changed the whole recipe, and now I really, really love it, and I serve it to guests. That's what I have to say about Frito pie. It's good. Rainbow cars. No, we don't have time for oh, that. Come I'm on. not doing rainbow come cars. On. No. Okay, I want to get to the meat. Here we go. Um, in this book, <laughs> Relationship Rich Education, they are talking about themes that you can find on a campus that is invested in creating this culture 
where we are finding relationships for our students. I, if I have said, since I read this book, um, relationship constellation once I have said it 150 times, it is such a powerful piece, um, as you're trying to make sure your students are anchored, uh, in, um, a lot of different areas on your campus. And so I'm going to go through some of these ideas. This is seriously, I should have called this episode episode like potpourri because these are just a bunch of ideas that are coming out of this book and um, really practical, high impact practices that you can have on your campus. I will say for all of them, they all involve a kind of mentor training, whether it's your peers to be mentors or your faculty to be mentors. And that's actually what we're going to talk about next week. So they have a whole mentor training section of this book that I'm going to lead you through so that we can talk about that. Um, Matt, you and I were saying recently, as we're, we've been telling schools like, hey, you need to get your mentors, you need to set them up with your high impact cohort, those sorts of things, that so often it's like, okay, here's your student to mentor. And people are like, no idea what that means. I don't know what it looks right. like. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. So you have to have a component of um, training and teaching for your peers and your faculty uh, in all of these elements. So we're going to set that to the side, talk about it next week, but I want to give you some ideas. The first one is peer mentoring. I think this is common. Um, this book is saying the ways that you invest in this relationship rich culture is obviously training on how to triage issues, like know what you can help a student with, what you can't help a student with. Um, also professional development. So in student development and higher education, make sure that you're letting your peer leaders have some of that professional development experience. It will draw really, um, uh, let's see, high caliber students into those positions because they will want to learn about what happens. I think there's a good reason why so many of the people that we know that work in higher education started as an RA, right? Yeah. It's like your first view into this business and thinking about, wow, I could do this and and just, you know, rise in the ranks. Um I also love peer mentoring. The question to ask is if your student population is more diverse than your faculty and staff population, then you should be leveraging student uh, peer mentors to support those students. So if you have <clears throat> an all one color, all one gender staff and faculty, and your student population is more diverse than that, then you can have some really good matches in that student population to support diversity. So I think and, that that's And we great. have seen schools that have done that really well and you know, so who they recruit to be RAs and um, and just engage from a student to student um, relationship and and really change the retention rates of those um, populations. So for yeah. for your student of color population, uh, being very intentional about you know let's make sure that that our community who our students are are engaging with are like them. So yeah, Matt, I was thinking about like the. The precursor to that is to say you have, for example, a white woman who's in charge of student success and retention, and you have lower student success and retention for African-American males, right? And so to say, how are we going to figure out how to support that population? Because clearly, historically, they've needed some extra support, maybe from a person different than who's in charge of it. So I love just that whole process. Um, of using peer mentors for that. This book really talks about how student leadership is a force multiplier. So it's like, think of a good thing you do and then get student leadership involved and it's gonna make it 500 times better. So I really, I love that idea. Um, do you do you wanna say something about well, that? Well, we just work so hard. So I just think about how hard our people work on building this sense of belonging, psychological sense of community and all that. And, and part of, this equation should be your students. Your yeah, that you could have a student you who helps that. fill that gap and and show no, you belong just like I belong. It's great. Yeah. Um, another idea in this book is learning assistance, which I love because it's flipping from teaching assistance to learning assistance. It's a really yeah. similar position, but it's putting students at the center. So your learning assistants would go to class. They would listen to the lecture. They would do small group things afterwards. 
Um, but it's a great way to leverage that peer leadership in those, in those classes. And they really talk about finding students who stumbled, but recovered in a class. So being able to say like, oh man, that first test was a doozy for me, but here's how I regained my footing, which I think is really um, a great idea. Also using students as um, learners and teachers. So this is a practice that comes out of Bryn Mawr where they have students that they have trained in good um, teaching techniques. They have a pair of them. Matt, I can't believe that the school actually does this. I can't believe faculty let them do this. I can't imagine, okay? So this is a hard, this would be a hard pitch on your campus. So they train these students. Teams of them go into a faculty member's class um, that is not their major. So like I'm a psychology major, so I'm going to a business class. And they take notes on the teaching style and the lecture and like what happens in the classroom. And then afterwards, the faculty member sits down with the students and they say, this was confusing. I liked this. You lost the students here. Um, wow. Let's just start there. Wow. But I do want to say in terms of a tangible uh, signal that says teaching is important. We want to be really good at it. This is a collaborative experience that is a very clear sign on this campus that we believe in all of those things, right? And and want that to be a relational experience. So, so the first, I mean, just thinking about faculty is the, the first pushback is, you know, we're starting to move into this uh, students as customers where I have to get the customer feedback. And I've been doing this lecture for 20 years. I know how right. to teach it. I don't want, you know, these students coming in and telling me how to run my class. Okay. But listen, I love the idea that you're going from receiving knowledge. Like I'm just supposed to show up as a student and you're supposed to just like give me knowledge to like, no, we actually are active participants in this 50 minutes that we have together. That's what I was going to say. So my pushback uh, to faculty who would ask me about uh, managing my class, like my students were customers is, no, students are not customers, but we're co-producers. We're co-producing this experience in this room. And so yeah. if I have them on my side, and we have this understanding. If I understand this is a better way for them to uh, capture this, for this to stick with them, then I'm going to be, I'm going to be a better teacher. So, yeah. um, I really but it is it. definitely a culture challenge. Absolutely. Absolutely. What I think is interesting is they listed some things that have come out of this experience. And so they're so simple, Matt, but um, for example, students said to a faculty member, can you, before you teach the lesson, just tell us because. So we are going to talk today about blah, 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 because it is going to be helpful for you as your whatever the thing is, or because if you understand history, you can understand the, the current, like, just help me understand why we are doing this right now, which I think is great advice. Well, right? I, yes. I was just thinking about the, because I said, so that doesn't oh, work. No, you, that's not a good answer. That's not good. But you just think about like when I was teaching career and life planning, Hey, we're going to talk about decision-making today because a really big obstacle when you're choosing your career is that if you have trouble making decisions, you'll feel anxious all the time. So you need to understand your decision, right? It just would change everything yeah. instead of just launching into whatever you have to say. So I love that one. Another one that came out was, um, can I, can I, I'm sorry, Rachel, but, yeah. but on that, I think for us, when we're having conversations with students outside the classroom, but taking the time to give them the why is really important. And, and I think it allows that it is stickier when they can connect. I'm not just hearing this, but, but there is actually a why. What? Yeah. I'm thinking, well, I'm just thinking about, you know, my story about telling Kendra, she has to go meet her, her faculty. A really yeah. big mistake was I didn't say because you want them to like you and connect <laughs> with you and whatever. And so she was like super bossy and not likable. And so then she came back and I was like, I'm sorry, I missed that part the reason you were doing that is this, right? Um, but yeah, I was thinking about everything you do, 
If you think about when we're training our faculty about telling students that they're making a referral, I'm making a referral to Lighthouse because they have resources and they're going to be able to help you recover. If you are saying we are putting you on academic recovery because we have a lot of confidence that you will be able to be successful here and we have to, yeah. I mean, I think you're right. I think with all, everything we do with students, we should be saying, let me unveil the expertise that I have that I want you to, to own, right? The reason we want you to declare your major is because we don't want you to take extra classes and blah, 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 blah. So I think what that's a great, great, hey, what a great exercise to the things that you're telling students to do. You need to answer the because, and, and right. you really need to assess, is that a weak reason? Yeah. Or, or like, like, is this well thought out or is this just because that's the way it is? Right. For sure. Yeah. Cause you know, that stuff makes me crazy. We don't like that. Um, another thing that students said to faculty were, were like, Hey, you need to give us messages. Like you guys don't realize how much you've learned. Cause I just keep throwing new hard things at you, but you are making great progress and you've learned so much already. Um, so just, these are just little things that I don't think are revolutionary, but I think the conversation between a student saying to a faculty member, Hey, we need more encouragement in that class. That feels really overwhelming. Help us understand why this is so important to you. I think is such great conversation. So I'm, I am a hundred percent behind that one. I love it. I think it's a great, are you moving on? No, no, no. Go ahead. I just think it's a, so just thinking about, so if I were at a university and I'm trying to change culture and I want this to be a part of it where faculty are, are it's going to be scary, but we're going to be better. We're, we're going to focus on excellent teaching and it comes from the president. It comes from the provost and there's training, not only to the faculty, like these are the key things that we're wanting students to, to comment on, but then to have that conversation with these students who are identified as as part of this SALT uh, team, the learners and teachers, that that could create a, a really neat system for um, from your provost down for everyone to be on the same page. Like you're going to teach differently. The, you right. have a different style, but make sure that you're adding because make sure that you're doing these key things and thinking about one thing that you said about this is it's so helpful to have multiple people sit in that class because yeah. Oh, I didn't like that. You did this. And I didn't learn that. And another student would say, I actually loved that. I remember part. that because, yeah. and, and we know as teachers, you have to have different styles and approaches to, to reach everyone, but just having that culture where everyone understands this is, this is just going to make us better. And I think ultimately to your point, have a better, deeper connection with our student, which yeah. is what we want. The yeah. other thing that I wanted to say about this all of these things, the learning assistance, the, the peer mentoring, doing SALT. What I love about this on the academic side is you could be creating a pipeline and creating kind of casting a vision for students who otherwise had never considered being in higher ed um, to come back, to get their doctorate, to come back and teach. When they can kind of, the curtains kind of lifted and they can see yeah. what goes on behind. Well, that's complex. It's not just standing in front. There's a lot that goes on. And I like this. This is enriching. It changes lives. So I like yeah, so this it's as like, a. It's like RAs moving forward in student development, right? That you would have yeah. these the student learning process yeah. where you'd be like, oh, I might want to come back and do this. So yeah, I think it's great. It's great. Okay. Um, also, there's a lot of ideas in this book that I'm just like, how is that not a thing everyone is doing? Um, Rachel Elam is in town this week, which is super fun for her to be here. She and I were sitting on the couch this morning and I was like, I read this thing in, in the book and I was like, how is it that not every campus is doing this idea? Okay. Here's what okay. it is. Faculty, ad, uh, faculty mentors for every athletics team on your campus. Why aren't we doing that all the time? Yeah. I was thinking about all the problems it solves. So first of all, you know, you guys know athletes, a huge part of their identity is the fact that they're an athlete. When I would, I love teaching football players. It was one of my favorites because you just have to say like, Hey, I saw you catch the ball on Saturday. And they're like, you did. And then you're, you're friends for life. Also, if yeah. they're not doing what they're supposed to, you just call the coach and they make sure they <laughs> do it. Right. 
But this idea of having a faculty member that's like, I am the volleyball mentor. I'm going to show up to their games. I'm going to know what the girls have done. I'm going to, you know, be in the cafeteria on Thursdays when they have their team lunch. I'm going to spend time with them. And I love it because, first of all, there are things that athletes don't want to talk to their coaches about. There's competing um ideas there, right? Like, I don't want you to know I'm feeling overwhelmed. I don't want you to know that I am struggling because I'm on the bench. I don't want you to know, like, I want to be mentally tough and I don't want to talk to my coach about it. So having a faculty mentor that gives you another person you can go talk to besides your coach, I think is genius. Also, if at any point, you know, we're always talking about unanchoring from a team. If at any point you have a student who gets cut or they quit their team, you already have this strong faculty anchor that can pull that student into different community. So I think that that's genius. Also, I think faculty would love it. Like you have faculty who love baseball, who go to every baseball game anyway. Why not make them the mentor to that team and just make that an official thing where they're having conversations and being close to those students. So I love that idea so much. Just thinking about our schools that are, that have a a large student athlete population. um, I mean, again, that ought to be kind of baked into this is who we are. So we we need to serve our students in all of these ways. That's great. Yep, I love it. Um, another thing is, uh, creative office hours. So, you know, we're always talking about office hours, how that sounds like students definitely shouldn't come because you're going to be in your office working, but actually it's the opposite of that. So there are all these faculty in this book that are like, Hey, first of all, we're going to call them student hours because they're for students. Second of all, we're going to have them in the res hall so that when students are coming in and out, they see their faculty member there and they can go over and talk to them. They're more likely to talk to them if it's a casual encounter. They're more likely to talk to them if they have a friend with them. So they don't wanna come in and sit by themselves, but they have some security if they can bring someone with them. They just stumble upon them. And then it doesn't have to be about the class. It really is about building relationships. So you can have rich conversations about things that students are interested in or worried about or that you're interested in. Um, One of the examples in this book is this faculty member who does student hours in a res hall. And then as he's talking to somebody, he's like, hey, so it sounds like you really love, you know, whatever, football. Um, Will you do a... 12 minute lesson next week for everybody who comes to office hours on your favorite team. And the, and the student's like, yeah, sure. So then the next time when they're all together, the student says, here's my team, here's what I love, blah, blah, blah. It's a very concrete way of getting students to share about themselves and building out this relationship, rich structure in your classes and in your res hall. So I love that. I don't know. I said this to you earlier and you looked at me like I was crazy. You know, there's a game, there's like a party game now where you make a PowerPoint about a thing that you know about. So like, I'm going to make a PowerPoint about um, the, like Meghan Markle, who is a princess, you know, and I'm going to tell you everything I know about it. I have 10 minutes to build this PowerPoint and then everybody will know something about this thing that I know super fun because you just pick random things, but it is a concrete way to help your students share things that they love and find like passions uh, that they have together. So I think it's a great idea. I think it would be really fun to do. See, I would have, I I could have started off and said, Rachel, will you go through your Frito Pie PowerPoint, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. I can do a PowerPoint on Frito Pie for you for sure. Um, I think you could do this with, with RAs too, RDs too, right? So you're just, again, we're talking about collision hours. We're talking about you're out and about, yeah. Hey, I know you love this thing. I'm looking at the way your room is decorated. Will you do a quick PowerPoint for us on this? And it will be really fun to listen to. So I think it's a great idea. Um, also I love this idea of redefining honors. So there's a school that is like, we have an honors college, but we are not just considering academic aptitude. We are also considering resiliency and, ten- uh, being tenacious leadership, curiosity, and ideas. And so the idea would be like, maybe you have a 3.0 GPA, but you're working 30 hours and you're, you know, doing these other things, but you have a really curious mind and you're asking questions all the time. You should be in the honors program, redefining that kind of, um, 
historic idea of what it means to be a scholar. Yeah. I love that. And especially I think, if, go ahead. Well, especially if we believe in kind of growth mindset, you right. know, like why right, are we not sure. crafting these opportunities for in fact, high achievers? I just, I was just listening to somebody talking about this idea of bandwidth recovery, which is so interesting. I think we'll probably do a show on it in the future, but it's basically like you have a hundred percent bandwidth, but then you have to work 30 hours a week. So that's cut. And then you're a single mom. So that's cut. And then it just like your bandwidth is eaten up until you have this very narrow piece to devote to your academics And it can sometimes look like you're not academically committed or prepared when in actuality, you're just carrying a mental load constantly of things you have to take care of and things that are stressful to you and overwhelming. And so recognizing like you have a hundred percent bandwidth, but you are devoted to these other things. You're still a scholar. It's actually super impressive that you're doing all of these things and still able to, to, you know, have some commitment to your academics. So I just think it's a great idea to open up honors in a much broader resilience, idea. tenacity, leadership, yeah. curiosity, and ideas, which, you know, yeah. I love that. Um, and I also like it because so often the framework of an honors college is very successful. We have smaller classes, we have more opportunities, we have mentorship, we have, right. It's very successful. A lot of times schools are retaining those those students oh. really well, oh, but yeah. it's because of the model. If you take that model and you say, think considering, you know, resilience and all these other things, we're going to say, you're going to have smaller classes and you're going to have connection to our best faculty. And you're going to be able to have these special opportunities. You will see retention and student success increase for that group of students. Cause it's a great model for how to keep them. So I, I think that that's um, such a great idea. Okay. Um, just a couple more for you guys. So thinking in this book, it talks a lot about how technology can facilitate relationships, which true that we know that's true. Um, one of the things it says is (laughs) using technology to give email templates to people on your campus to be able to connect with students. You know that we are a huge proponent of this. I'm always talking about language audits. I'm always talking about making sure that you are, you know, searching your email for hidden messages about how the student is doing a really bad job. But if you think about loading email templates for advisors, that's like when it's advising time, this is the template we want you to use. And you can tweak it and you can, you can make it um, special, but we don't want you to go in and like have to recreate the wheel. I'm telling you, Matt, I look at a lot of emails that student support services people and student development people send to emails. And sometimes I'm like, this is a really terrible email that you have sent to this student. Um, And so just cutting that out and being thoughtful about it. I wanted to give you some examples. Um, We have a email that we give to all of our clients to be used for red stoplight students. This is an email that we have crafted to make sure there is no shame message to make sure that it is all about, you've got plenty of time and we can recover. Okay, so here's what it is. This we send to students that have a red light. Congratulations on making it to your third week in the semester. This is the perfect time to assess how your school journey is going so far because you have plenty of time before finals and break to adjust your course so you end up where you want to be. It looks like in at least one of your classes, you're struggling to achieve academic success. I know from experience, there are a lot of different reasons students have difficulties in classes. I'm very good at helping students achieve success, even for classes in which they're facing some challenges. What's a good time for you to come in so we can create a plan so that over the next two weeks, we can adjust your path towards academic success warmly, Rachel. That is a great example of let's take some time to craft the language that students are going to respond to. And then don't make all of your advisors do that 50 million times. Just give them that email and say, you can tweak this, but this is what we want you um, to use. So I think it's such a great practice to to just have standard. Here's what we want you to send, right? 
Um, one more that I want to give you, you know, when we work with our schools on impact cohort, which is about groups of students who historically have not been successful, and we have a whole workflow that we build out for schools, like in this month, here's what you do, here's how you contact them, here's the activities that you have. Um, here's an example of in October, hey, student, if you're feeling overwhelmed, you're not alone. October can be a tough month with what feels like a million assignments and exams. I thought you might be interested in a quick list of some academic resources available to you on campus. It's not too late to have a great semester and make yourself proud. As always, I'm available to you for both serious and silly chats. Just schedule an appointment. Super well-crafted, right conversation style, getting them the information that they need, inviting them into that relationship with you. So I just, I think it is so important to have those best practice emails at the ready. So as you're going through that, Rachel, I'm assessing it for, okay, is this person, does this person come across as reliable? Is this someone who's knowledgeable and has given me assurance? Are they responsive to what I need? And, and is there some empathy in that? And so yeah. I just think it's such a great, great example. Yeah. Um, okay. I have, let's see, I have three more for you. Wait a minute. No, I have four more for you. The first one I love so much. There's a school that ask their students, I forget the time frame, but I think it's at the end of the freshman year. So it's like second semester when they do their student survey, they say basically who on campus is your strongest support? Who would you celebrate with? Something like that. And every name that shows up on that list where a student has said, you know, Rachel Elam is my support, like she's the one who's going to help me be successful. The campus invites everybody who shows up on that list, faculty, staff, it doesn't matter who they are, to a dinner, a very nice dinner, come and sit with us. The provost stands up and says, you guys are doing a great job of seeing our students connecting with them, supporting them. Thank you so much for your commitment to them. We see you. We appreciate the way that you're creating these relationships with, with students. They will be successful because of your commitment to them. And then they have a dinner and then they do it again every year for freshmen. Um, it is just such a, again, tangible way to say that is an expectation on our campus that you would have students who list you as the person that is their relationship anchor. I just, I really love it. It makes me feel so good. So for, for me, there's two parts to this. Um, one is, of course, if a student doesn't respond, doesn't have a person, yeah. we need to get to work. Uh, so that's really important. But but the second piece of, again, um, you know, how do, how do we build this culture where, so when I think about those students, um, who have slipped through the cracks. They don't have those relationships, but now we're, I have a, I have a fly flying in oh. my face right now. Um, but, but Hey, we're going to build, we're going to continue to reinforce this, encourage our faculty and staff to have, this is a very important part of being a, a in our community. So yeah. be very intentional about that. And it just starts to get to a place I could see where like five years later, that is so much a part of the culture that you have fewer and fewer students slipping through the cracks. Yeah. So it's, it's just a, a super practice. Yeah. I love it. Um, okay. I was on a campus this past, uh, well, you were there too. We were on a campus this past week um, and we were talking to um, their enrollment manager, who's just such an incredible student success brain. I really yeah, admire yeah. him a lot. Um, and he was saying, we were talking about their, they do their stoplight surveys. And Jose was like, you know what I would really like? This is a school that has a lot of athletes. He was like, you know what I would really like is that on the first day I was, I was talking about having faculty put the stoplight survey in their syllabus. So not just early alert, but also stoplight survey. And he was like, I would really love for faculty on the first day to tell our mostly athlete students, Hey guys, we got 21 days. I'm going to be watching your performance for 21 days. So I'm going to be looking for how you're successful, what behaviors you're doing. Like we have measurements, right? It's like the combine, like I'm paying attention to all of these different things. And then at 21 days, I'm going to give you some feedback, red, yellow, green, and then we're going to do what we need to, to get you all moved to green. So just be thinking for the first 21 days, this is where we're assessing your performance. 
I love it, Matt. I can't believe that no one has ever thought of that before, but it's genius to say to your students, this measurement is coming and it's early enough for you to recover. We just need to have an assessment super, uh, super soon so that you can make progress forward, forward. And the thing I love about it is we were also talking about habits and how do you break bad habits? And what I like about this, Hey, you have 21 days. If you have students and and their coaches are talking to them too, and they know this is going to come, then um, they start kind of going the right down the right path. Well, you do that for 21 days. You're, you know, you're developing good habits. So yeah, for sure. Really, and really I love strong. it too, because you know, what we say is that yellow light so often that's just like, Hey, I see you, you need to make some corrections. Well, why don't we tell them before we give them a yellow, we'll tell them on the first day I'm watching, I'm assessing, I'm looking yeah. for successful behavior. And if you do it for 21 days, you're good. And if not, here's the course correction. So I just, I, want, I, I wonder so what would have happened to Rachel Phillips, uh, her freshman year. Yeah. If, <laughs> I would have been like, somebody's paying attention to me. Oh, okay. I better get it together. I love that. I was talking to another great student development mind um, who was saying that they changed their tutoring center. What they found was they would walk students over for tutoring and students are like, I don't need tutoring. I'm fine. Right. And they're like, what are we going to do? Because you do need tutoring, right? So they changed their tutoring center to the academic uh, excellence center. And they doing really well. We know that you've got this. We know that you have the tools you need. We just have to like step it up to excellent. So these are the group of people who are really good at academic excellence. And they're going to help you with that. They increased their traffic and their tutoring sessions by that change from something like 53 students four years ago to like 600 students today, which is amazing. Language is important. Um, But the other thing that they did is they started hiring even only for a couple of of hours a week athletes to be tutors and to kind of run tutoring sessions. So what happens on a campus, the difference between I have to go to tutoring with this person versus my junior football teammate is running a tutoring session on Thursday right after practice. And he says to me, I will see you there, teammate. And you're like, yes, you will, <laughs> right? right? The shift of, I want to go, I want to be with my team. I want for these football players to, to um, my teammates to help me be successful in my class. And that's part of what it means to be an athlete. Part of what it means to be an athlete is you're going to go and be excellent at the academic piece. So I love that one too. I I was thinking like, even like I said, if it's only two or three hours, you have two hours a week where we have this football player who's going to be there and his team because he's well-respected and a a leader of his team, his team's going to show up and they're going to work on whatever um, they need to. So I think it's so much better than saying you have to spend this amount of time in study hall when we don't know what they're doing. You know, it's like, okay, do I have to accomplish a thing or like, why, why am I doing this? So love that. All right, Matt, that was fast well, and furious. <laughs> uh, I, just to wrap it up, student leadership is a force multiplier is, is really important. And investing in this student-centered culture, um, so just all of these different examples of ways that you can do that, but leveraging your students to help you with that, um, especially right now, as we're kind of feeling, you know, pulled in a lot of directions, wearing a lot of hats. And if we could just bring our students on board to help us with this, um, yeah. it's great for them. It'll be great for you. And I love that it could create this new pipeline of uh, students who see higher ed as a worthy pursuit, uh, a place where they can change lives, it maybe, you know, a place where they, they belong long-term. So... Well, thanks, All right. Rachel. Well, next, yeah, next week we're going to be talking about how you train your mentors. So join us then. Otherwise, you guys have a great week. Good to spend time with you.